Okay, so today we are here to talk about um, writing and structuring your affirmative LD cases. Uh, how many of you have learned at least a little bit about debate or LD at this point? Okay, so a few of you. Um, one of the things I have here for you is packets of evidence, so you'll get to see a sample case that you'll actually be using later on in the day. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the basics of Lincoln Douglas <coughs> debate. Uh, so first of all, just some basic background on it. Where did the name Lincoln Douglas come from? It actually came from a series of seven debates between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas in the 1800s. And uh, they were obviously sort of campaigning, and the core of their debates was really about the ethics of slavery. And so traditionally, Lincoln-Douglas debate has been value-based, so looking at the sort of deeper, uh, more basic beliefs, but later on, it uh, evolved to emphasize policy. So a lot of the resolutions you'll hear will be about taking specific actions, um, usually at the federal level. In terms of the way LD works, uh, you get one policy resolution for the academic year, and it's generally specific, so you all have to talk about the same topic, but it's broad enough that you have a lot of room to interpret and bring your own unique cases to the round. So this year, the resolution is resolved. The US federal government should increase its development of the Earth's moon in one or more of the following areas, energy, minerals, and or water. So sometimes the resolutions are a mouthful, but uh, as you can see, sort of guides you as to what topic you're gonna talk about, but you have some room to interpret there. The way an LD round looks is that there's two debaters, one affirmative debater and one negative debater. And you have specific time allotments and you take turns giving your speeches. So the times are up here. Uh, there's gonna be five speeches total. Uh, the first affirmative constructive is six minutes and that's where you lay out your case, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, how to build that. The first negative constructive is a seven minute speech in which they respond to the, to the first one. And then you can see it goes back again. So then you have your first affirmative rebuttal, which is another six minutes, the first negative rebuttal for six minutes, and then the second affirmative rebuttal for three minutes, which is the last speech in the round. The other thing about Lincoln Douglas is that you have set times for asking one another questions. Uh, so you get three minutes after the first affirmative and after the first negative to ask the other speaker questions about their case. The other thing you get in a Lincoln Douglas round is four minutes of prep time to use however you like. Generally, people will take um, maybe two minutes before their second speech and another two minutes before their last speech. And for the negative, they would take two minutes before their first speech and two minutes before their uh, second one. But you can, you can sort of break that time up however you like over the course of the round. Doing good so far? So when it comes to LD, there's a couple of things that as the affirmative you are solely responsible for. Um, these are called your burdens. So the affirmative burdens include the burden of proof, which is that you need to provide arguments that justify or demonstrate the need for change. So generally the way resolutions are worded is they're a call to change from whatever currently exists. So as the affirmative, you can't really defend the status quo, um, but you need to sort of justify that need for change, that call to action. The other important thing you need to do is have a prima facie case. And this means sort of um, at first look or on face that your case is complete enough to persuade a reasonable person um, at first glance that those changes are needed. And what prima facie really means is do you have all of your stock issues? So stock issues are what we're going to talk about today. There's two different ways we're gonna talk about constructing a case. The first one, uh, the acronym is HIPS, and that's because you lay out, um, first of all, harms, so you give examples and explanations as to what the need is for change in the status quo. So identifying problems that exist uh, that need to be fixed. The second component is inherency. What prevents those harms from being fixed in the status quo? Is there some sort of roadblock? that keeps them from solving themselves, e.g., why do we need your plan to put this into action? And then there's your actual plan. So how do you, as the affirmative, think that we should fix those problems? 
And then solvency is the last component. Uh, so this is an explanation of how your plan will solve the harms that you started out talking about. And you want to know, or you want to make note if additional good things will happen. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think that I was supposed to go to the parliamentary debate. Okay. I said. I, so I'm gonna. Yeah, go for it. I'm sorry. No worries. So I heard Patrick Mullen or Sometimes you will see an additional um, sort of component to this when you're hearing other people use these structures, where they'll have a, an entirely separate section for advantages or benefits to the plan that comes after something. I knew I didn't want to take this. We'll go over these in a little bit more detail, um, but this is sort of one of the first structures that you can use when you're putting a case together. The second type is an advantages-based structure, and this is a little bit different. It still includes all of the same components, but they're reorganized. So you can start with inherency, uh, which is, that again, that explanation of the roadblocks that currently exist move into your plan, so whatever your proposal is, and then you have different um, advantages and the subpoints under there are an explanation of a harm, explaining how your plan solves that harm specifically, and then talking about the benefits of solving that harm. And you would do that for however many advantages you have, whether that's two or more. So it's the same information, just reorganizing. You might see other variations on case construction too. There's not really a universal style that people use. Um, but once you get more familiar with the event, you will definitely start recognizing which components uh, are which and how to argue those. about LD is that it's an evidence-based event, so I want to make sure that you get these packets of evidence. These are a good example of how cases might be laid out, as well as the way to format evidence for them. So this is the affirmative case here. I'm going to give you the negative evidence as well, just so that you have it for later. <coughs> I assume that you can have more than two advantages, or is it, is it limited to only two? It's not limited. Um, you can have more than two. Generally, you'll only be limited by the time constraints. So if you can put it in only six minutes, uh, you're good. So the evidence cards that you have there, um, if you open up the first page, you'll see what some of them look like. Basically, this is how you include your information. It's kind of if you were writing an essay and you were going to cite a quotation, how would you incorporate that into your overall argument? So the way that these are set up is that there's a tagline. You'll see at the top that there's um, like a bold sentence, and that's basically your topic sentence or your thesis statement for that argument. When you're reading this evidence in a debate round, that's the part that you would really want to emphasize and say clearly, because that's the part that people will be writing down. After that, there's the citation. And you can see both on this example and in your packet, the first part of it, so the author of the organization and the date are bolded, and that's the part that you would read out loud from that citation. And then after it, the, there's more complete information included in there, but you won't read that out loud. Um, but if your opponent asks to see your evidence, they can see the full citation of where that information came from. And then in terms of the actual content of that card, that's the evidence that you would read. And there should be specific sentences that are bolded. <coughs> Those sentences are the ones you'll read, but you have to leave the other information in for context. Again, if your opponent asks to see the card, uh, they need to be able to see the entire context of, of where your sentences came from. So this is something that your coaches will probably work with you more in detail on. Um, and a lot of teams also work together as a team to develop a team case. And then once they're more experienced, sort of break off and develop a separate one. So in terms of applying some of these concepts that we've been talking about for stock issues, uh, let's say that our resolution is homework should be eliminated. What kind of harms would justify the need for an action like that? What's bad about homework? It takes too much time. OK, it takes a lot of time. It's not fun to do. Not fun to do. Um, they should be able to cover the material in the class. Okay, use it in, do, do, use class time to cover content. 
Great, so maybe some of the things, right, like if students don't have enough time to complete their homework and have a good life balance, uh, maybe they're not getting enough sleep, uh, not at their highest learning capacity during class, all of those things might be things that you lay out in the harm scenarios of your um, first affirmative constructive. And for each of those, obviously, you would cite evidence, right? Maybe you want to say that um, after students finish their homework, the next uh, class period starts too early in the morning, and then you would cite uh, things about how problematic the lack of sleep is for students. How about inherency? Uh, I want to make a note about inherency here. This can be two different types. It can either be structural, so something existing uh, sort of is legitimately blocking it from happening, happening, so maybe there's a law that prevents or requires something. Um, or it can be attitudinal, so that sort of appeal to true tradition, oh, we keep doing this because we've been doing it. Um, so social norms, values, or beliefs can be attitudinal. So in terms of banning homework or eliminating homework, what in the status quo would keep that from happening? Yes? Um, the lack of time teachers feel that they have in the classroom to cover the material. Okay, great. So there's that tension between wanting to finish the work in class, but maybe just not having enough time to do it. And do you think that would be structural or attitudinal? That would be more structural. Okay. Because it's sort of that, that specific time frame that you're working with. Is there anything else? Yeah. Um, a lot of times students have to uh, pocket a lot of money out of their own uh, budgets, and some students do not have access to uh, uh, a lot of resources. So they may, that might be also a financial burden upon them. Okay. So that might be a kind of a structural inherency that can, uh, well, it might be attitudinal, but I think it's more structural because it's like, if you're not fluent, if you're fluent, then you have the advantage. Because <coughs> then you can afford tools and computers and those things that you might need. Okay, sure. Yeah, and and if you are don't maybe have to maintain a job outside of school, right, you probably have more time for homework versus if you go straight to work afterwards. Okay, yeah, so we've got some external factors that are keeping policies like this um, in place. When it comes to the plan, um, this is also, there's some variations here, but generally the things that you as an affirmative want to uh, have in mind for your plan are the mandate. So what is your specific course of action? So what are you specifically going to do to change the status quo? And that's called the mandate. There's also the agent, which is the individual or the organization who enacts the plan, so who puts it into action and makes things happen. There's the enforcement, and this is the person who um, enforces the plan. So maybe you have one organization uh, pass a law, but then a separate entity would have to make sure that that law is actually being Funding is an explanation of how the plan will be paid for. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do here. You can say normal means, and that might mean like either through taxes or through sort of grants um, that maybe like schools regularly get that's planned for in the budget. Um, so normal means can sort of take care of your funding, and sometimes plans don't require funding. Other ones you might need to identify a specific source, depending on what you're And then the last component is the timeline, so when the plan will happen. A lot of times in Lincoln Douglas, you won't necessarily hear speakers go through all of these planks for the plan, uh, but they're definitely something to keep in mind, and if you're on the negative, certainly think about asking the affirmative about these specifics, because if they don't have those answers, that might mean there's weaknesses in there. resolution, homework should be eliminated. What are the logistics of that? How would we actually implement that plan? Homework makes me sick. Yeah, so, how, yeah. Um, so what you do is you work with the, um, uh, well, it's kind of the plan. Okay, so homework should be eliminated by increasing uh, classroom time uh, for students to go complete tasks within the classrooms. To change the policy to 
to uh, you know the school's policy, university policy, to work like that. Okay, so um, sort of working to make other adjustments to make that plan work. Sure. Um, yeah, and so part of it would just be even beyond like making those extra adjustments because that might sort of go beyond what the resolution is calling you to do. You might even just say, okay, well, you know, schools will no longer require homework and go through whatever that needs to go through the school board or whatever that might need to go through. Or maybe that they pro prohibit homework. Okay, yeah, sure, right. Like maybe schools get like funding withdrawn if they're requiring homework or something. And that might be part of like the enforcement for that plan, right? Okay, and then the solvency is the last component. So how would this action, how would eliminating homework solve the harms, some of the ones that you threw out at the start? People would get more sleep, more time to work, and do productive things. Okay. Yeah, be more alert during classroom time. Okay. Great, yeah, so to a certain extent, sometimes solvency evidence is just uh, um, explaining like why those harms no longer exist. So it's not that difficult. Um, in terms of explaining why it's solved. And then additional advantages that maybe aren't related to solving those specific harms, but are sort of unexpected benefits, you can also include those as advantages at the end of the, the case. Any questions about this overall sort of structure or process? Okay, if you look at your <coughs> packet of evidence, you'll see that this one is set up a little bit differently, right? This one is set up like the advantage structure. So the one that we just worked through was the hip structure. But if you look at here, you'll see that it starts with inherency and then moves on to the plan. And you can see that this one specifies some of those components, so timeline, funding, agent, and enforcement. And then on the third page, you can see that it moves into the specific advantage. And the, like I said, the LD topic this year is about the moon, and there's a separate session on that. Um, but then you can see how it sort of goes through the, the different components of the advantages and uh, sort of explains like how these actions are going to solve some of those problems. So hold on to that. So in our last few minutes, I think we're still trying to stay on schedule with getting out of here by 9.50 uh, or so. Um, I want you to work through this new resolution, maybe partner up with someone, and come up with a basic outline of that hip structure. So if your resolution was resolved, the U.S. federal government should legalize marijuana. Think about what are some of the harms that would justify legalizing marijuana, uh, what's currently in place keeping marijuana from becoming legalized, what could you do to uh, sort of change, <coughs> actually legalize it, and then how would legalizing it solve the harms that you So go ahead and take a few minutes, um, maybe partner up, or you can just throw your ideas out and we can talk about them. I think I have a little bit there. So what are the harms? Harms and for legalizing it? So are the harms sure. for legalizing it or for not legalizing it? It would be for not legalizing it. So yeah. as the affirmative. So the current, what the harms so are. So where's our argument to not legalize it? Okay. Um, right. so people are in jail. Your, this is your argument. This is your job and so you're, to prove about, this. Yeah. So we're saying the harms should are legalized legalized the status quo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So what are the problems? The first one I can think so. of would be. Um, the benefit, the medical benefits. Okay, well, um, but um, on the okay, so uh, that's not harm. No harms. Uh, harms are like of not using it, right? The lack of so use like, of medical benefits. Of not legalizing it. Yeah. You so, just reshape the way you're saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you said like the harm is that more people can't be using it people for are, medication because it's not legalized, yes. would be a harm. There's medical benefits that people so, cannot yeah, cannot use exactly. because it's illegal. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's the harm? Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, we have prison overflow. Too many people Okay. So yeah. too many people go to prison over maybe a trifle thing. Well, then, yeah. yeah. Okay. How about you? Um, how about you? Uh, <laughs> we we lose revenue uh, that the government can use through taxation and. Uh, Um, and, and taxing corporations and those kinds of things that could get into it and develop it. We also lose touch with safety. We, the government can't enforce safety standards over something that's not legal. You see what I mean? Yeah. Like the FDA can't like help to say, oh well, I mean, you know, this marijuana is all full of heroin and meth, so don't use it. This one's like, you so know, USDA approved. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing that's kind of sketchy by weed on people. Right, well, because you don't get it at a gas station. Well, yeah, that's so kind of what I was going to say. I was going to say public that health. Yeah, public it's health. not regulated really right now. That's right. So cartels and drug dealers, I don't know, it's like dangerous and can get out of control. So you got to go to your local drug dealer, happen. but then if your drug dealer's not telling you, you got to go to another drug dealer. <laughs> so this guy's kind of scary. Yeah, he's kind of scary. He always brings like, guns and goons with him. Yeah. yeah. That's a harm. great list of harms. So then, what would the yeah. inherency be? So inherency, like what's preventing us from doing it? Government, man. Government, government. Definitely the man. So uh, that, so that's like a structural, right? So government has a law. They got to figure out a way to tax it. And well, well, they have to figure out a way to rewrite the law. <laughs> um, how about you? As for attitudinal, people have sometimes bad impressions of what. Okay. Uh, Pots, right or wrong. Or you yeah, moral. Drugs. Yeah, or you use drugs. What the, I don't know, what's justified and what's not justified. Okay, how about you? Uh, I don't know if that's different. Oh, uh, moral, sorry, but that's done. Uh, um, I would say something along the lines of um, that the government it would look, could potentially look hypocritical if they reverse course. If they spend all this money to try to make it illegal, Flip try to convince off. people, it, it, it can make them lose um, face okay. or maybe credibility. Although I don't think that's a very good reason. Oh, so um, it's federal government, so this is not like nationwide legalization? Yeah, that, that's, that's what this is, like, not states. Okay, just that's um, what I thought you were so, um, yeah. Sometimes the, you know, the federal government has it as a class one, or class one or class five, whichever is the most extreme. Schedule drug. five drug. Schedule five drug. And so, um, and they're reluctant to want to move the very dangerous drugs on that schedule by like marijuana. Yeah. <laughs> From the list. Totally. So, I mean, and other things like Clorox bleach and pneumonia are probably on that list of uh, if you drink it or something, it's a bad idea. Yeah. Not really, right? <laughs> um, so, this is this is a great list for currency. And just to, you don't necessarily have to include both just, structural and attitudinal. You can have just one inherency argument, whereas you'll want several harms. So, mm -hmm. and then and there's also just the the, uh, the divide between people in general for it and against it that is not easily, uh, there's not, there's not like an overwhelming stance in any, in any uh, over nationwide over um, its legalization, at least in, in some places. All the stoners who get to vote. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's 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 so misconception maybe or prejudices against the use of marijuana. I was gonna say people aren't like people informed, think properly informed about like realistically the pros and cons of smoking weed. Like, right. everyone's different, but so are we applying it? Uh, yeah, I just want to say one thing about this. So definitely this process of thinking of and researching all the possible sort of roadblocks is great. And then you'd want to pick uh, like the one or two things that you can find the best evidence for and that are the most persuasive. So you don't want to, you don't want to use too many inherencies then, huh? Right, because keep in mind that part of your job is to not only identify the inherency, but then overcome that inherency. Um, so you don't necessarily want to come up with so many arguments that it's impossible for you to get past. All right, uh, moving on to plan. Okay, so this is this the fun one because we all have to agree with. Uh, <laughs> uh, or or at, least, at least I have to agree with. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do about it? Well, no, that, is, that doesn't seem to do a whole lot for the national government. You know, vote out our politicians, 
Excuse me? Or Colorado. <laughs> the vote for Federal Colorado is president. You gotta put it on a bill or a ballot or whatever. No, 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 that's only statewide. The federal government doesn't do that. Well, oh, yeah, that's true. This is so, it could either be like you could have a certain amount of weed or legalize growing it yourself or do you, like, or the government would regulate it probably and be able to sell it like they sell alcohol. Okay, so then uh, maybe lobby um, Congress and the president and state legislatures because the more states prove, the more it makes it hard for the federal government to keep not approving it. So lobby those entities to uh, maybe put it on ballot initiatives on the states so that it puts pressure on the federal government. Right, can the plan be like twofold of multiple things, like change the schedule of the drug and then put it under oh, the same steps. classification as alcohol, like put two steps? Yeah, yeah so. Process. Um, a couple of things. One thing that you're thinking about is like, what can citizens do to sort of make the government do this other thing, like in terms of like voting or lobbying? And as the affirmative debater, you actually are that policymaker, and you have the power of what's called fiat, uh, which is like a magic wand. You get to wave it once for your plan and say that this this plan will happen. So instead of needing That's to convenient. to rally the voters, <laughs> you can say, "We'll legalize marijuana. Uh, like that will happen." Um, and that's sort of your prerogative as the affirmative, because that's what the resolution is asking you to do, right? Okay. So the, the plan is we will legalize marijuana and have it be classified uh, under similar laws to those re regulating alcohol. Right. Except, except for alcohol, we'll also be changed to age 18, because I don't know why it's the only thing that in the freaking country that's age 21. Agreed. So you're an adult. But don't drink, that's illegal, and we're going to send you to adult prison if you do it. It's yeah. so stupid. It's ridiculous. Don't die for your country, vote for the president, but don't go have a coffee. That's true, in the military, you cannot drink alcohol, you know that, if you're under 21? Is that bullshit? Okay, anyways, <laughs> and then what would some of the um, those like sub points of plan be? So in terms of the, this is the mandate, what about agent and enforcement? No, oh, agent, um, the federal government would be the uh, Congress uh, with the presidents and the president, because they have to sign it, would be the agents. Okay, great. And then, would we need separate enforcement? It'd probably just be like uh, three police officers who handle yeah. all that. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. same entities, that you just expand those entities that would do the alcohol stuff and make them do the uh, marijuana stuff too. Okay. We already have all, probably too many of those in place already, <laughs> right? But you know, you just use the same ones. Why? Why reinvent the wheel? Right. Sure. They're, right. There's already like a, a an organization yeah. in place to manage that. Um, okay. So funding. then, funding. Would you need money to do this? Uh, we wouldn't uh, need much money because once you change the law, it's kind of done. You would need some money for to expand maybe the agency so that they're staffed appropriately to. Kind but wouldn't that be normal? Because it's taxing. It, it would be it would be normal means that's right and so the, the I was part of the plans like you need money but the how you get the money is to um, in the same way you do for alcohol alcohol is a tax applied to it when you buy it and so too with marijuana great so uh, as the affirmative all you have to say is this will be taken care of through normal means and then if someone asks you that information it's great if you're informed about it and you can okay. explain tax. it <laughs> yeah okay. awesome um, okay and then timeline. Um, within one week. Okay. I'm, I'm kidding, that's, a, that's ridiculous. But. Maybe as soon as possible. Yeah, well. That's okay. a common one that you'll hear. <laughs> oh, that, that's actually an answer? Yeah. Oh, that's that's a, seems like a very. Government answer, thank you. Seems, <laughs> yeah, seems to be a very convenient answer. All these things, everything we do, we'll do as soon as possible. As soon as possible. And then what about solvency? Which is what happened, how does it get rid of the wrongs? Yeah, how does it solve these harms? So, well, um, with more marijuana, with uh, you know going through the proper channels, you have a maybe safer product that uh, people who need it for medical purposes will have access to them. Um, prison, people would not, uh, it will reduce prison overcrowding because people would not be put into prison because of marijuana related uh, possession and uh, use loss or possibly even sales loss um, we would gain tax revenue because we're taxing it <laughs> what's happening so we're taking it 
Um, as far as the safety standards, that those would be more regulated. Yeah, I would say I would assume that there's there would probably be more um, safety around informing people about how to use it and what it might feel like because alcohol is legal and I think that schools there's just more information on it. Okay. I think when it's legal because it's more publicly understood it seems like so if it was legalized then people would probably understand it a okay. bit more. So a more informed public. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so sort of going through and explaining how this simple act of legalizing marijuana can take care of all these bad things that currently exist. So this is a great um, example of the structure that you can use, especially for when you're first getting into debate. Um, this is often sort of an easier structure for people to wrap their minds around than the advantages structure. Obviously, play with it, um, work with your coach to see what, what's going to work best for you all and your team. Um, but this is one way to include all of those components and make that logical argument. You can see how each uh, element is related to the next in terms of, of working through that process. So are there any questions about any of the things that we've talked about so far? Okay, well you all did a really nice job with that. Um, remember to hold on to your packet. If you do have questions later, feel free to come find me. Um, other than that, that's all I've got for this session, and have fun in the other ones. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, sorry for dominating that. Oh, no.